Yes, I am Medical College, Mumbai, ex Vice President of the Research Society for Study of Diabetes in India and past chairman of the Research Society for Study of Diabetes in India, Maharashtra. So, over to you. Thank you, Chair Prasad. At the outset, I must congratulate Rich and his team for this wonderful hospitality and the excellent scientific program. The topic given to me is insulin resistance in Indian diabetes, underdiagnosed and undertreated. See, we as Indians are an insulin resistant phenotype. And there are lots of studies which have shown that we have high insulin level, we have insulin resistance across the board. All over the world, there are a lot of studies which have been done which compare India with other ethnic groups and we have the highest incidence of insulin resistance. This is also from the UK video that I'm going to show you here. Why is that? We have an abnormal fat distribution and we are more prone to develop abdominal obesity. You see the Caucasians, they are fat, but they are fat all over. But you see an Indian, his fat is restricted to his abdomen. And that is what is the cause of all this. This is a very common slide which many of you must have seen. On this side is Professor Yunzik from Austria and that is Professor Yadnik from Pune. Both have the same BMI, 22.3. But look at the body fat. The Indian has 21 percent, the Austrian has just 9 percent for the same BMI. And what are the clinical manifestations of insulin resistance? Look at the last column here. It is a cause for diabetes, hypertension, ASCVD, heart failure, sleep apnea, PVD, stroke, PCY, NAFLD. All these are caused by insulin resistance and driven by insulin resistance. This is Indian statistics which show that a 30-year-old Indian is expected to live up to 75 years of age. But if he becomes a diabetic at the age of 30, he stands to lose 14.5 years of his life. And this is what we need to keep in mind when we are treating our diabetic diabetic patient. We want to protect that 14.5 years and make him live up to 85, 90. Why not? And what do they really die of? 80% of them will die of a cardiovascular problem. 60% of all dialysis unit patients are diabetic with end stage renal failure. Fatty liver mass is becoming a major epidemic now, which can progress to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma and death. Insulin resistance, why is it underdiagnosed? Because we are very glucocentric. The UK PDS told us that getting HPVC in 07, oh, fantastic. You get good relief. We heard two three speakers today talking purely about glucose control, glucose variability, glucose this. Look at this. UK PDS said 7, so the guidelines, this was the 2006 ADA ESD guidelines. What do they say? If HPVC is more than 7, then treat. Otherwise, don't treat. Very glucose centric. We are all only concentrating on blood glucose. That is not the story. Everybody thought that all right, you can be a 7, let us get it down to 6.5 and we will get fantastic results. So there were three major studies which were done Accord, Advance, and EAD. And what did they show? Kenga, nothing. Except there was a benefit in nephropathy with the Accord and Advance. The Accord was stopped because there are about 250 deaths. So what is the big message? The big message is good glycemic control does not prevent heart attack. You can get a heart attack with an HPA1C of 6.5 because that is not the cause of the heart attack. So the optimal treatment of type 2 diabetes is a good glycemic control. See, basically when you talk of complications of diabetes, you have microvascular complication and macrovascular complication. The microvascular complications are glucose driven. It starts from the time the patient becomes diabetic. But the macrovascular complications is because of the dysglycemia, insulin resistance, obesity, hyperinsulinemia, etc. 80% of type 2 diabetics are insulin resistant. <coughs> These are two studies which show that insulin resistance by itself is an independent predictor of cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction and stroke. This is a nurse's head study, which was done on nurses, followed up for almost 20 years. You know, they were to see what was the relative risk of MI and stroke. 
no diabetes. Almost 1,500 patients were diabetic at baseline. And when they had diabetes at baseline, there was a five-time increase in cardiovascular mortality. But what is the conclusion of this study? The conclusion of the study is that the elevated risk for cardiovascular disease began 15 years before the diagnosis of diabetes. And we are talking about glucose injury. Now, he is already a candidate for macrovascular disease. So insulin resistance promotes atherosclerosis even before it produces diabetes. So the question is, is there evidence that treating insulin resistance can help? What are the treatment options? Obviously, diet, exercise, weight reduction is the most important aspect for treating insulin resistance. And in the pharmacological treatment, you have metformin and pyoglitazone and HGLT2, which I put in white, because that is very economical and available. The GLP1, that is your, and then this is your uh, terzoprotide, and this is your retardotide. They show very nice weight loss and can reduce insulin resistance. But this is a study which takes a day. The highest study was done in non-diabetic patients who had a TIA or a HTB stroke. Why this study was done? Because a proactive study which was done earlier on patients who had a myocardial heart infarction and given pyogritazone showed a 47% reduction in stroke. So the neurologist thought, let's do this study. So they gave those patients who are insulin resistant is pyogritazone. They are non-diabetic patients. And what did they find? That 24% reduction in stroke. 24% reduction in myocardial infarction and 52% reduction in new onset of diabetes. So for the first time, we have specifically a therapy only treating insulin resistance in non-diabetic patients using biomedical, which has shown to prevent cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events. But in this same study, there was a subgroup of about 2,885 patients who were pre-diabetic. Not diabetic. But look at the outcome in that stroke and myocardial infarction combined reduced by 40%, stroke itself by 33%, acute pulmonary syndrome by 52%, and new onset of diabetes reduced by 80%. This tells you the importance of treating pre diabetics. We are only glucose centric, pre diabetic lifestyle modification alone or partner ICM. But this is what needs to be done. So the American Heart Association and the Stroke Association have now recommended pyogritism can considered to prevent recurrent stroke. So the treatment options, like I said, is metformin, pyogritism, and SGLT2. But why are we under treatment? Treating insulin resistance will be all the benefits which I already described. Pyogritism is the drug for treating insulin resistance. It is cheap, freely available, and add metformin to that, add SGLT2, and it becomes a fantastic treatment one. But still, it's an underutilized batsman. To my mind, he is the best, best batsman in the entire team. But for whatever reasons, political or otherwise, He's been sidelined. He's not been taken in the team by most people. And that is where the problem is. So there is a comeback story for Pyogre. It is his sheer, you know, his skill as an excellent cricketer, which can be placed at any opening batsman to last night. But now, seeing his caliber, he is getting included in the team. Now, what was it? Why was Pyogre being on the other side? It was almost hanged because of these things. Weight gain and it is. It does cause weight gain, yes. But look at this. After 16 weeks of pyogenism, the subcutaneous fat has reduced by, increased by 42% when you do pyogenism. But look at the visceral fat, which is a pathological fat and reduced by 25%. And if you see this cartoon, it reduces the high triglyceride and free fatty acids, the intramuscular, intrahepatic, intra-abdominal fat, 
fat in the artery are all reduced and subcutaneous fat improves. And this is where the action of biopredicone comes. So, though there is a weight gain, it is the result of a redistribution of fat from visceral to subcutaneous, which are metabolically healthy. And plus, biopredicone affects the anti inflammatory adipokines. When you have inflammation, you have the TNF alpha interleukin, which are all increased, which are pathological, which are atherogenic. But the adiponectin, which is anti atherogenic, is reduced in direction. Pyrethrum increases the adiponectin. And it is noteworthy that weight gain and weight, not weight loss, were associated with increased survival in the proactive study. The proactive study showed that there was an increased incidence of heart failure, but no increased death. And those patients who gained weight lived longer. And I have heard Ran Difran just said that I don't mind my patient gaining two, three kilos extra weight if he is going to live five years longer, rather than make him lose weight and kill him five years earlier. So that is the crux of your weight loss. Edema, 5 to 10 percent have edema, and the best combination to do that is if you add the HGL people with pyrethrin, that edema is gone, and even then the net weight loss, there is no weight loss. Then next we come to bone fractures. Bone fractures are generally seen in postmenopausal women, it doesn't increase in men, so that is a gone. So basically, don't use the pyrethrin on a 60 plus female. Bladder cancer. There was a lot of talk about bladder cancer. In fact, in 2013, the government of India banned bladder cancer. I was the one who stood up and called a press conference and set the ball rolling. And in a month, the thing was withdrawn. But bladder cancer is past history. There is no evidence of a direct connection of bladder cancer. Right? Yeah. There is no direct evidence. But still, when you use pyrethrin, if the patient has an active bladder cancer or a history of bladder cancer, do not use the drug. This is not different to Robert Ryder's comment on pyrethrin. Inexpensive, very effective at reducing HPLC, no evidence of bladder cancer risk, and plenty of evidence of cardiovascular benefit. Now we come to the of heart failure, which is cardiologist, oh, pyrethrin, no. Heart failure, right? heart failure, right? let's see. This is a proactive study which was done. Patients who already had a myocardial infarction were given pyrethrin. Recurrent fatal MI reduced by 28%, acute coronary syndrome 37%, secondary stroke by 47%. Yes, there was an increased incidence of heart failure, but there was no increased mortality. Even those patients who had heart failure did not die. This is again Ralph Ifranjo study of the effect of pyrimidazone on the cardiac muscle. It reduces HPA1C, it really increases the infusion of glucose uptake by the muscle, increases glucose uptake in the myocardial muscle and increases the myocardial blood flow also. And look at this, the ejection fraction is increased, the transmitral flow is increased, the end diastolic volume is increased. The left ventricular flow rate is increased. So it is cardio beneficial. So when you talk of pyrethrin and left ventricular, improve the left ventricular diastolic function in subjects with diabetes. It is not cardio toxic. That is what everybody tends to believe and makes a false story about it. It ameliorates myocardial insulin resistance, augment, augments myocardial blood flow improves both left ventricular diastolic and left ventricular systolic function, reduces blood pressure by decreasing heart rate. So left ventricular diastolic dysfunction in diabetes is correlated with myocardial insulin resistance and both are improved by pyrimidazone. You do a 2D echo on any diabetic, you will say diastolic dysfunction is there. Standard 2D echo report for any diabetic. Pyrimidazone can help with that. So pyrimidazone exerts no negative effects on myocardial function and can be used safely in patients with type 2 diabetes without clinically evident cardiovascular disease. What is the RSCD recommendation that if patient has an addiction fraction less than 45, do not use pyrethrin. 
इफेक्ट ऑफ बायोमेट्रिक में मैं सी वी रिस्क फैक्टर एंड बाय वन थिंग प्रो एक्ट टू शिकागो पेरिस्कोप आई दिस स्टडीज एट डन दैट दिस वी एच एस सी बट द शिकागो स्टडी लुकिंग एट द कैरोटिड इंडिमा मीडिया सिग्नेस विद ग्रिपराइट दी कैरोटिड इंडिमा मीडिया सिग्नेस इंक्रीजेस विद बायोमेट्रिकल एंड कम डाउन दिस इज द पेरिस्कोप स्टडी डन बाय स्टीव मिस स्टीव मिस इज द वन हु केम रोजिंग एट अप बाय सेइंग दैट इंग्लिश इज अ हार्ड प्रॉब्लम दिस वाज डन इन पेशेंट्स With IVS, intravascular ultrasound, they looked at the echoma volume and they gave five echoma and glutamate for 18 weeks. Patient on glutamate, the echoma volume increased. So it's basically anti-echoma. This is a very interesting study done by Helen Stromman from the European Multi-Database Cohort Study. It is called where they looked at patients who had been exposed to fire and non-exposed to fire. Both had 30. Data. But look at the. This is cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular deaths. Look at this here. 691 as compared to 2000. Deaths are much less in those patients given by the people. Non-cardiovascular death, all-cause death. And if you look at cardiovascular specific myocardial infarction, is three times more in patients not given by the people. Even heart failure. Here it is 47, here it is 132, and these are these are absolutely matched groups. So basically, the conclusion of this analysis is that mortality was 67 percent lower in patients treated with biopsy. Comparison of the May outcomes, the proactive study showed a robust 28 percent. रिडक्शन इन मे With compare with our five group, this is a care subgroup study which looked at patients who had glucose intolerance with myocardial infarction, and what is the effect of giving a statin? It takes six years for a 25 percent reduction risk reduction, but at three years, no change. But in the proactive study, at three years there is a 19 percent reduction. Telling us that this is absolutely an anti-electrogenic drug. What do the recommendations say now? ADA guidelines 2024 says you treat patient with ASCVD with GLP-1 or HGLT-2, and then the next drug is a glitter. GLP-1, HGLT-2 glitter. Now, glitter cell progression is what causes the progression of the disease. This is a UKPDA study that they have studied. Decline in beta cell. These are eight studies using sulfonylurea, and the steady increase over the years. That means the beta cells are dying. These are eight studies with beta zones, durable glycemic control. And why this happens? Because pyrimidine causes mobilization of the toxic lipids out of the beta cells. That reduces glycotoxicity. There are other trials in terms of the effect of the beta cells. There are other trials in terms of the effect of the beta cells. There are other trials in terms of the effect of the beta cells. There are other trials in terms of the effect of the beta cells. There are other trials in terms of the effect of the beta cells. There are other trials in terms of the effect of the beta cells. There are other trials in terms of the Doesn't work as good as this, but look at this. This is the stock diabetes study again done by Ralph Differenzo. The annual rate of incidence of diabetes for lifetime is 4.1. Five years ago, metformin is 1.7, but five years ago, it was metformin plus GLP-1. There is no diabetes. There is no progression of diabetes. So the answer is simple: non-pharmacological therapy like diet and exercise. Does not work in the real world. You need to treat these patients properly so that they will live longer and nice. So, what do the current guidelines say? This is the age 20 to 23 guidelines. If your patient, is, this is for pre-diabetes. If the patient is obese, you give GLP-1. If he is very obese, you go for bariatric surgery. Or next phase, you give metformin, pyrimidine, and agar. एक आंकड़ा दिया पूर्ति में तो जो है स्टॉक एनआई डीजी की स्टडी भी देखा था तो बीच और दैन इट कैन थ्रू बट मेड ट्रेंड देयर इज अ पाइप इंटरनल मेट्रोन इंसुलिन रेजिस्टेंस एंड 
NAF ending. This is the endocrine recommendations. Age. 90% of type 2 diabetics have NAF ending. 37% of them have already got NASH. And 20% of the diabetics have significant fibrosis. This is at the time of diagnosis. This is our paper which we have published on diabetics where we looked at 1,521 congenital diabetics, where 75% patient, of the patients have fibrosis liver and 27% already have fibrosis and you never know. So you have to be treating all this from day one and what is the life of treatment? All this RTC, RCT show, I think the one is the drug in all of them. This is the age guidance which says pyogenol and GLP1, pyogenol and GLP1, pyogenol and GLP1 and SGLP1. This is the ADA guidelines 2023 which says pyogenol or the GLP1. These are the beneficial effects of pyogenol. Stroke, reduction in intima media thickness, reinfarction, stroke, hepatic cellular carcinoma and mass in people. This is one proposal which has come to look at giving biocritical in patients with established cardiovascular disease and what they say is video combination of metformin, biocritical and inspiration. And look at the benefits. All the negatives of each drug is taken care of by the quality of the other drug and does wonders. So, conclude, there is strong evidence that biocritical can retard the atherosclerotic process which is shown by Periscope and Chicago. Reduce cardiovascular events in large randomized prospective cardiovascular outcome trials like the IRS and prospect proactive study. It can reduce the incidence of stroke in proactive and IRS. Pyogenol is a potent insulin sensitizer, preserves beta cell function, causes durable reduction in HbA1c, corrects multiple components of metabolic syndrome, and improves non alcoholic fatty liver. So, what is the best combination? The best combination is GLP-1, HGLP-2, or and biogen. And then you can add to this a metformin or a sulfonylurea insulin as required. But this is a very expensive combination. So what is the best cost-effective combination is metformin, HGLP-2, biogen. Then you can add a little bit for sulfonylurea and an insulin. So what is the strategy? Macrovascular damage starts many years before the onset of diabetes. I repeat, macrovascular, macrovascular damage starts many years before the onset of diabetes. Microvascular complications are list, linked to dysplasia. Insulin resistance and its complications and beta cell preservation have to be adequately addressed for positive long-term outcomes. If IR and dysplasia are treated, metformin, pyro, and SGLP to most durable, no weight gain. And start as early as possible from day one. You don't have to wait. So to conclude, pyro is a very valuable treatment option in Indian patients with insulin resistance. We are insulin resistant. And it is recommended by all the guidelines. Benefits far outweigh the risk or imagine the risk in this patient responding well to biocritical. Careful selection and monitoring is required. If insulin resistance and dysplasia are adequately treated right from day one, you will be able to prevent and minimize all the diabetic complications, including NAFID. And believe me, those patients who are on biocritical right from day one, their HbA1c comes to 5.5, absolutely well controlled without any hypoglycemia. So treat the disease diagnosis, not just the symptom hyperglycemia. This would be my concluding remark. Thank you very much for your time. बहुत ही कम समय में इतने ढंग से समझने के लिए पढ़ी आज बहुत आसानी से समझ में भी आ गया बायोडेटा जो हम बहुत दिन से यूज करते थे लेकिन ये नहीं समझ में आ रहा था कि इसको इतना जो है सौतेला व्यवहार क्यों किया जा रहा है क्या इसके पीछे कोई कमर्शियल रीजन्स हैं क्योंकि सस्ती दर्द
with Ramana. And I have heard Ram Nishantra say that I don't mind my patient gaining 2-3 kilo extra weight if he is going to live 5 years longer. Rather than make him lose weight and kill him 5 years or 2 years. So that is the crux of your weight loss. Edema, 5 to 10 percent have edema. And the best combination to do that is if you add the LGL people with pyrimidine alone, that edema is gone and even then the neck weight loss, there is no weight loss. Then next we come to bone fractures. Bone fractures are generally seen in postmenopausal women. It doesn't increase in men, so that is a gone. So basically don't use the pyrimidine alone in a 60 plus female. Bladder cancer, there was a lot of talk about bladder cancer. In fact, in 2013, the government of India went bladder cancer. I was the one who stood up and called a press conference and set the ball rolling. And in a month, the thing was withdrawn. But bladder cancer is past history. There is no evidence of a direct connection of bladder cancer. Right? There is no direct evidence. But still, when you use pyrimidazone, if the patient has an active bladder cancer or a history of bladder cancer, do not use it. This is Ralph different or Robert Ryder's comment on pyrimidazone. Inexpensive, very effective at reducing influence, no evidence of bladder cancer risk, and plenty of evidence of cardiovascular benefit. Now we come to the test for heart failure, which is cardiologist, oh, pyrimidazone. No. Heart failure or heart failure or Let's see. This is a proactive study which was done. Patients who already had a myocardial infarction were given pyrimidine. Recurrent fatal MI reduced by 28%, acute coronary syndrome 27%, secondary stroke by 47%. Yes, there was an increase in incidence of heart failure, but there was no increased mortality. Even those patients who had heart failure did not die. This is a Ralph Ifranjo study of the effect of pyrimidazone on the cardiac muscle. It reduces HP1C, it really increases the infusion of glucose uptake by the muscle, increases glucose uptake in the myocardial muscle and increases the myocardial blood flow also. And look at this, the ejection fraction is increased, the transmitral flow is increased, the end diastolic volume is increased. The left ventricular flow rate is increased. So it is cardio beneficial. So when you talk of pyrimidazone and left ventricular, improve the left ventricular diastolic function in subjects with diabetes. It is not cardio toxic. That is what everybody tends to believe and makes a false story about it. It ameliorates myocardial insulin resistance, augment, augments myocardial blood flow improves both left ventricular diastolic and left ventricular systolic function, reduces blood pressure by decreasing heart rate. So left ventricular diastolic dysfunction in diabetes is correlated with myocardial insulin resistance and both are improved by pyrimidazone. You do a 2D echo on any diabetic, you will say diastolic dysfunction is there. Standard 2D echo report for any diabetic. Pyrimidazone can help with that. So pyrimidazone exerts no negative effects on myocardial function and can be used safely in patients with type 2 diabetes without clinically evident cardiovascular disease. What is the RSVD recommendation that if patient has an index infraction less than 45, do not use pyrimidine. Effect of pyrimidine on CV risk factors and biomarkers, the proactive Chicago periscope IV studies have done that, this we have just seen. But the Chicago study is looking at the carotid intima media thickness with glimiferite the carotid intima media thickness increases with pyrimidazone and comes down. This is the periscope study done by Steve Nissen. Steve Nissen was the one who killed Rosinator by saying that he means it's a heart problem. This was done in patients with an IVAS, intravascular ultrasound. They looked at the echoroma volume and they gave pyrimidazone and glimiferite for 18 weeks. Patients on glimiferite, the echoroma volume increased. So it's basically anti echoroma this is a very interesting study done by Helen Strongman from the European Multidatalist Cohort Study, it is called, where they looked at patients who had been exposed to pyre and non-exposed to pyre. Both had 31,000 plus 
data. But look at the, this is cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular deaths. Look at this here, 691 as compared to 2000. Deaths are much less in those patients even by the Non-cardiovascular death, non death all-cause death. And if you look at cardiovascular, specific, myocardial infarction is three times more in patients not given by antigen, even heart failure. Here it is 47, here it is 132. And these are, these are absolutely matched groups. So basically the conclusion of this analysis is that mortality was 67% lower in patients treated with biotech. Comparison of the maze outcomes, the proactive study showed a robust 28% reduction in myocardial infarction, 47% in stroke. HGLT2, empamiflorin cannot afford that. Reduced maze by 14 and 13%, that was 28%. You look at the JLP1, leader and sustain, maze by 13% and 26%. Rapenses, the oral semiglutide study has just come out, sole study, last week it has come, 14% reduction in mace. Then we will compare with our bio. This is a care subgroup study which looked at patients who had glucose intolerance with myocardial infarction. And what is the effect of giving a statin? It takes six years for a 25% reduction, risk reduction. But at three years, there is no change. But in the proactive study, at three years, there is a 19% reduction. Telling us that this is absolutely an anti electrogenic drug. What do the recommendations say now? ADA guidelines 2024 says you treat patients with ASCVD with GLP1 or SGLT2, and then the next drug is a little GLP1, SGLP2, little now, beta cell progression is what causes the progression of the disease. This is a Ubiquitia study that there is a study decline in beta cell. These are eight studies using sulfonyl urea. And the steady increase over the years. That means the beta cells are dying. These are eight studies with beta zones, durable glycemic control. And why this happens? Because pyrotechnism causes mobilization of the toxic lipids out of the beta cell that reduces glycotoxicity. There are other trials, interventions which have been done in DPP in diabetes prevention studies. Doesn't work as good as this. But look at this. This is the stock diabetes study again done by Ralph Differenzo. The annual rate of incidence of diabetes for lifestyle is 4.1. Five metabolism with metformin is 1.7. But five metabolism plus metformin plus GLP-1, there is no diabetes. There is no progression of diabetes. So the answer is simple, non-pharmacological therapy like diet and exercise does not work in the real world. You need to treat these patients properly so that they will live longer and nice. So what do the current guidelines say? This is the age 2023 guidelines. If your patient is, this is for pre-diabetes. If your patient is okay, you need GLP-1. If you very okay, you go for bariatric surgery. Or next phase, you give metformin, pyrimetazone and acarpos. Acarpos they have put there because you have to stop any disease study with acarpos which showed that it can be. But main drug there is a pyrimetazone and metformin. Insulin resistance and NAF ending. This is the endocrine recommendations. ACE. 90% of type 2 diabetics have NAF ending. 37% of them have already got NASH. And 20% of the diabetics have significant fibrosis. This is at the time of diagnosis. This is our paper which we have published on diabetics, where we looked at 1,521 positive diabetics, where 75% of the patients have fibrosis, and 27% already have fibrosis, and you never know. So you have to be treating all this from day one, and what is the line of treatment? All this RTC. RCT show pyrimetazone is the drug in all of them. This is the age guidelines which says pyrimetazone and GLP-1, pyrimetazone and GLP-1, pyrimetazone, GLP-1 and SGLP. 
This is the ADA guidelines 2023 which says biometrizone or the GMP1. These are the beneficial effects of biometrizone. Stroke, resistance to the media thickness, reinfarction, stroke, hepatic cellular carcinoma, and NASH gene people. This is one proposal which has come to look at giving biometrizone in patients with established cardiovascular. And look at the benefits. All the negatives of each drug is taken care of by the quality of the other drug and does wonders. So, conclude, there is strong evidence that biometrizone can retard the absorption steroidic process, which is shown by Periscope and Chicago, reduce cardiovascular events in large randomized prospective cardiovascular outcome trials in the IRS and prospect proactive study. We can reduce the incidence of stroke in proactive and IIS. Biometrics is a potent insulin sensitizer, preserves metastatic function, causes durable reduction in HbA1c, corrects multiple components of metabolic syndrome, and improves non-alcoholic fatty liver. So, what is the best combination? The best combination is GLT1, HGLT2, or and biometrics. And then you can add to this a metformin or a sulfonylurea insulin as required. But this is a very expensive combination. So what is the best cost-effective combination with metformin, HGLP2, biotechnology? Then you can add a little bit for sulfonylurea and an insulin. So what is the strategy? Macrovascular damage starts many years before the onset of diabetes. I repeat, macrovascular, macrovascular damage starts many years before the onset of diabetes. Microvascular complications are list, linked to dyslexia. Insulin resistance and its complications and bitter cell preservation have to be adequately addressed for positive long-term outcomes. If IR and dyslexia are treated, metformin, pyrin, and SGLT to most durable, no weight gain and start as early as possible from day one. You don't have to wait. So to conclude, biometrics is a very valuable treatment option in Indian patients with insulin resistance. We are insulin resistant. And it is recommended by all the guidelines. Benefits far outweigh the risk or imagined risk in these patients responding well to biometrics. Careful selection and monitoring is required. If insulin resistance and dysplasia are adequately treated right from day one, you will be able to prevent and minimize all the diabetic complications, including NAFID. And believe me, those patients who are on biometrics right from day one, their HbA1c comes to 5.5, absolutely well controlled without any hypoglycemia. So treat the disease diabetes, not just the symptom hyperglycemia. This would be my concluding remark. Thank you very much for your time. बहुत ही कम समय में इतने ढंग से समझने के लिए पड़ी आज बहुत आसानी से समझ में भी आ गया बायोडेटा जो हम बहुत दिन से यूज़ करते थे लेकिन ये भी समझ में आ रहा था कि इसको इतना जो है सौतेला व्यवहार क्यों किया जा रहा है क्या इसके पीछे कोई कमर्शियल रीज़न्स हैं क्योंकि सस्ती तब मेडिकल जनुवेर के सेल्स एकदम भूख हैं। तो यहाँ भी वो ऐसा ही किया गया। बट कुछ लोग पिछले खड़े थे कि ऐसा नहीं होना चाहिए। बट अभी आप देखो सब जो भी मल्टीनेशनल हैं, जहाँ भी उनके ये होते हैं, उसका पाल भी बात ही नहीं कर रहे, बात ही नहीं कर रहे। हाँ, और अभी क्या ये जेनरिक हो गया तो नोबडी I also want to ask a question, sir. Sir, uh, I've been using this 5 liter zone in the NASH patients especially. But my experience was he, uh, a patient had suffered from high BP and water retention. What is your opinion regarding this? So when you're using it for NASH, you have to use 30 milligrams. You have to use 30 milligrams. 30 milligrams is the dose. 
if there is a fluid retention because of that, and if you have no cardiac problem, you can give it a Thank you sir, बहुत-बहुत धन्यवाद। अब चुकी समय, समय काफी हो गया है।